The 1939 40 Fair had a storybook magic about it that delighted everyone. Architects had let their fancies run, and enchanting shapes proclaimed a wonderland. This was going to be fun. Alice had her wonderland, and Dorothy her land of Oz. But New York had the fair, and it was pure enchantment. Physically, Commissioner, what will the new fair look like, do you think? Well, physically, it will look uh, not unlike the 1939-1940 fair, only better, bigger, <laughs> taller buildings. There'll be uh, more elaborate exhibits. There'll be more modern exhibits. There'll be more costly exhibits than at the last fair. Mm -hmm. What do you feel will be the overall results of the 1964-65 fair, the effect on the world and so forth? Well, it's very hard to answer that. The, uh, aside from amusement, aside from attracting people to New York, uh, benefiting New York by bringing a great many visitors here from the hinterland and from abroad, I think it's likely to have a very uh, substantial effect on international affairs because the people meet here on common ground. There aren't any ideologies involved. There's no diplomacy involved. And here on this four and a half acre site is rising the magnificent federal building. Its theme, challenge to greatness. Here will be exhibit halls, a theater, and tributes to our American heritage. At the groundbreaking ceremony, our late president, John F. Kennedy, met Robert Moses, president of the fair. We have roamed these United States and literally combed the globe for pavilions and exhibits which will reflect the achievements of all men in industry, culture, the arts, and harmless entertainment. We confidently expect more than 70 million visitors to an unforgettable pageant. Then the president. I want the people of the world to visit this fair and to come to the American exhibit, the exhibit of the United States, and see what we've accomplished through a system of freedom. From these aerodynamic tests came the data that made design analysis possible. Mathematics of analysis posed its own peculiar challenge. Unisphere had to be completed by April 1964. High-speed computers were used to solve the thousands of problems that would have taken years if attempted manually. Perched atop a sculptured base, which must suggest lightness and grace, Unisphere would have to withstand the enormous and changing forces of the wind, as well as its own weight. The continents and islands would act like sails, and wind pressure could exert forces nearly equal to the weight of the entire structure. Because Unisphere is open and its land area is irregular in size and position, the wind blows on either the outside or the inside, the front of a continent or its back.
of different pieces had to be cut, formed, assembled, and welded. Box girders, tubes, beams, channels, angles. Special automatic and manual welding methods were employed. An upper meridian section is welded. The south pole is assembled. Land areas were fabricated and assembled on this turtle-shaped fitting table, which duplicated the exact curvature of Unisphere. Conformed to United States Army Engineering Corps contour maps, mountains and valleys are shown in exaggerated relief in order to achieve effective visualization of elevation. Wrapped to protect the stainless beauty, sections were shipped by rail and highway to Unisphere's site. Just ahead of the construction of the pedestal, 30 USS T1 steel anchor bolts are set and the concrete base poured around them. First structural member to go into place is the South Pole. Next, one of Unisphere's largest members, a lower meridian, is carefully fitted into the South Pole and laid across the pedestal. Actually welded girders, the lower meridians will support the entire structure. Right at the site, many of the members are field welded into sub-assemblies nicknamed orange peel sections. To provide support and access, a temporary mast is placed along Unisphere's polar axis. When the structure is complete, Unisphere will be self-supporting and the mast removed. The southern hemisphere, like a giant bowl, is completed in 83 days.
becomes a world of stainless steel when the last flag-topped section is set in place. of the land areas can begin. Delicate work. No job for windy days though, because the sections act like big kites if not securely held. It remains only to raise the three orbit rings. Weighing three tons each, the orbit rings are field welded into a continuous single piece 450 feet around. Special care is taken to protect the polished surface. To prevent bending, each orbit ring is lifted by four cranes, each attached at three points. An intricate communication plan and network links all hands. Precision teamwork means that the orbit rings rise slowly and evenly. About 50 stainless steel guy wires connect each ring to unisphere just as spokes tie a bicycle wheel rim to its axle. Strong and light, they are so difficult to see that the rings seem to float in space. Only 162 days after construction was begun, Unisphere is complete. Its challenge successfully met. Crystal Palace, Eiffel Tower, Trilon and Perisphere. Unisphere now joins these and the other memorable timekeepers of progress. New York, New Jersey exhibit building, there'll be a restaurant, movies in the round, and a heliport, offering flights direct from New York City to the fair. Here making the first official landing is the governor of the state of New York, Nelson A. Rockefeller, New Jersey Governor Richard Hughes, and other distinguished guests.
the Bears sports program is exciting. In the stadium, the Mets home games and the all-star baseball game. Many of the 1964 Olympic trials will be held at the fair here in the arena and in the pavilion. so close to opening day that tickets are already on sale all over the country. is driving in from out west. catching circular station is surrounded by three circular pump islands.
Wilsons got here at last. The Wilsons take the motor train for an overall view of the fairgrounds. the symbol of the fair, the great Unisphere. Here's a pavilion with a musical spectacle. Here, Pepsi Cola's tribute to UNICEF. Here's a salute to the children of the world. Johnson's Wax has a suspended theater. A suspended theater with a film on the joy of living. At General Electric, his amazing animated figures. Then there are those who are attracted to a dramatization of the history of electricity. From its beginning to the mighty bang of nuclear fission. And here's the spot they head for, the General Electric exhibit. A show where the audience revolves around the stage. The stories of the states. Places to stroll and places to rest. Our country's challenge to greatness. This theme has a special appeal to many. In the United States Pavilion, colorful presentations trace America's progress from the dramatic past to the challenge of space travel.
the Chandras find a machine that playfully demonstrates the law of averages. Here's a new way to go to a show. The whole grandstand is lifted up into the theater. Teachers find new ways of presenting complex ideas to their students. Soap bubbles reveal the beauty of geometry. Abbott and Mrs. Todd are going into a show on the history of communication from Tom Tom to Telstar. Fascinating exhibits of photography by Eastman Kodak. Some folks head first for the exhibit where they can see the world's largest outdoor photographic prints in color. Here, 15 exhibit sections demonstrate dramatically the influence of photography on many aspects of modern life. The Wilsons set off to explore the pavilions. enter a pavilion with a roof like a stained glass rose window.
York City's exhibit, a scale model of the entire New York metropolitan area in astonishing detail. AMF's exciting monorail. the flume ride if you wish. Here you can rush over green flowing water like a carefree lumberjack. Teachers have lunch at the Chinese pavilion. There is a world of travel. The Chandras go to Spain. Miss Abbott and Mrs. Todd visit Indonesia. Country after country displays its treasures. The Pietà of Michelangelo. Japanese, the art of drinking tea is almost a religious ritual.
It's only a short walk from Asia to Africa. Here's a late arrival coming to the fair in his own way. and kids need a rest and so do their parents so they leave them in a nursery for a while by chance the Wilsons and the Chandras meet and join up for sightseeing At the Ford exhibit, they will enjoy a unique and exciting trip through a fantasy land of the past, present, and future. to see another show together. At General Motors, take an auto ride into the future. Welcome to the world of tomorrow. Climb aboard. You are about to take a journey out of this world into the world of the future. Forget the world around you. Forget the people around you. 
you are entering Futurama alone with your own thoughts. Have you ever wondered where we will find the food, clothing, and shelter we will need to sustain the world's exploding population in the years ahead? In the timeless distances of outer space, perhaps? The technology of today is already helping us penetrate the silent darkness of space. Man himself has taken the first tiny step into this vast unknown, and we can only imagine what resources will soon be brought back to Earth by these early pioneers. But what about our own Earth? Are there not still resources here to meet the needs of the world tomorrow? What about that great unexplored continent at the bottom of our Earth? larger than the United States and Europe combined. Already Antarctica has become a great scientific laboratory for men of all nations to discover great new land areas rich with natural resources. Antarctica is but one area of great promise for the future. What about the others? What about the sea? We have long sailed its surface and fished its depths. But at the very bottom is a land of undreamed of abundance, with enough food to feed the Earth's population seven times over. There are rich ores and minerals carried by submarine trains to process stations on the coast. There is the water itself to be drained from the sea and made fresh as rain to turn desert lands into fertile land. There will even be new areas for living and working. A whole new dimension of life for people of the future. Now, consider the thick, lush lands of the equator. Here, nature flourishes in its greatest abundance. Technology has finally led the way into the wild profusion of the jungle world. One day, this land will be transformed into land for farms and pastures for cattle. From the abundance of equatorial jungles to the barrenness of great mountain ranges, the future offers great promise. Once barriers to man's progress, the mountains will soon be traversed by multiple highways that will soar over canyons and cut through towering walls of granite. They will carry a life stream of minerals and other natural resources to the thriving industries of tomorrow. Highways, too, will open up the great expanses of desert lands, one day to be made fertile again by waters pumped from sea and river, from dam and mountain stream. The highways from great new centers of agriculture and industry will lead inevitably to the metropolis of tomorrow. Access will be easy to the heart of the city, the core. In and around great cities like this will live many of the people of the future, a future of limitless hope and promise. Many people have a special interest in the history of transportation.
Wilsons have picked up their children from the nursery. They go exploring a Belgian village, an old European town to wander in. At dusk, a new fair comes to life.
one way to see the fair is on your father's back. This, of course, can lead you to some wonderful sights. You can also do the fair on wheels. Not The fair police can help you too, and they're always present if you need them. Billy Graham Pavilion. Happily, the fair has catered to fountain lovers. Their waters refresh the spirit and delight the eye. Someday, all this will be a great city park and many future citizens will find this heaven on a summer's day. prefer to make eating at the fair a kind of picnic, which is not a bad idea if you have a heavy schedule of sightseeing ahead of you. Sixty percent of the visitors carry cameras to the fair, and they've got a billion dollar backdrop against which to pose their subjects. You will see the strange and the exotic, the unusual and the colorful. Speaking of the unusual at the fair, take in the daring eagles of Mexico. They do an act from a high pole that's worth traveling a thousand miles to see. Thank you. 
every fair has pied pipers to attract buyers. A lot of young fair goers seem to want their wares, especially hats, hats with waving plumes. And not only do mothers keep a watchful eye upon them, the fair police stand ready if a single one of them should stray. Older children, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs bring the magic of storybooks alive. Is it the real world or the unreal world? Here you can hobnob with celebrities of make-believe. No wonder children like the fair. Look around in the lake amusement area for a roller coaster built just for the younger set. of the visitors write to someone about the fair. Each family receives a special coupon good for a free gallon of gasoline at their local Sinclair dealer station. These are a few of the millions of car-owning, traveling Americans who will be telling their friends about the fair and about Sinclair Dinoland for years to come. Sinclair Dinoland, in a prime location surrounded by titans of American industry.
The miniature of Brontosaurus is one of the highlights of Dino Land. Visitors make their own souvenirs. This has helped make it a favorite. In fact, Dino is the most popular souvenir sold at the fair. Coca-Cola's World of Refreshment. And here is the world's largest electronic carillon. More than 600 bells. A replica of the flagship of Christopher Columbus. The Santa Maria lies moored by the shore of Meadow Lake. And neither Ferdinand nor Isabella ever saw it as well as you can. from Switzerland and the Swiss Sky Ride. Exhibits for your home, too, at the Better Living Pavilion. For Micah's World's Fair House. A refrigerated cart, ready for wheeling into a game room or out onto the patio. Perfect for keeping foods and drinks cool for informal entertaining. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. Now let's continue our journey into imaginative design and new concepts from the far corners of the world. Wonderful. 
beautiful. And all that room for fresh foods, too. this dishwasher holds. Well, I must say, I certainly am getting around. I can sure use a good cup of tea about now. Look what's over here, a laundry center. How convenient. How convenient. simple these controls are. <laughs> it happened again. Well, look at that. A second oven. How wonderful. Just pull it out for easy cleaning. Hot.
World's Fair parking lot accommodates 10,000 cars a day. And any time you have 10,000 cars in one place, there are going to be service problems, all kinds. Including this. A motorist in need is a Sinclair service opportunity indeed. That's why fast, efficient Sinclair help is always ready just around the corner. Thanks to special service facilities throughout the parking areas. 25 service telephones connect directly with Sinclair service. Calls for help are answered promptly by a specially equipped service car. This is another example of the kind of service Sinclair is telling motorists at the fair to expect wherever they see the name Sinclair. Across the fairgrounds, there's another 10,000 car parking lot. Here too, a Sinclair service station welcomes travelers from all parts of the nation to the excitement of the fair. Incidentally, the fleet of more than 300 buses that takes motorists from parking lots to the fair gates also uses Sinclair products. But not everybody comes to the fair by car. One of the outstanding features of the World's Fair is this modern marina, the largest on the eastern seaboard, equipped to handle a thousand boats at regular berths and at the many offshore moorings. In addition to private boats, visitors also come by speedy hydrofoils. These run on a regular schedule from New York City. A feature of this marina is an ultra-modern floating service station, a completely new concept in marine service designed by Sinclair. Boat customers are served the way they like to be served, at sea. Another example of pioneering by Sinclair. continue in operation after the fair is over. Another way Sinclair makes favorable impressions. Impressions on which you can capitalize at your service station. My family will never believe me. Hey, Mom, is dinner ready? Coming right up. How does it look? Delicious. And you can tell us about going back to the World's Fair today. Did you have fun? I sure did. Everything I saw was out of this world. <laughs>